Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Anybody here um, today because um, you wanted to be here with somebody else? You came with a friend or a spouse? You know, not that you came yourself, but you wanted to be supportive of somebody else coming. Anybody here today, not because of belief, but because of support for somebody else that way? Anybody here today who ever has doubts? You know, uh, Frederick Beekner said that we never gather in church and without a, a thought in the minds of those who are there being, is it true? Is it true? Anybody here ever come wondering, is it true? So I think this scripture text may be for you. This comes from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter. It's after Easter. And note that there are two resurrection appearances here. All right? Note that. When it was evening on the first day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand at his side, I will not believe. A week later... His disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may not know this, but in the parlance of clergy, and music directors in churches, and maybe it's kind of gotten ensconced in the parlance of the community as a whole. This Sunday is known as Low Sunday. Did you know that? It has to do, I think, with the natural ebb and flow of energy. Last Sunday was Easter, and this is the Sunday after Easter. And so um, clergy call it Low Sunday, um, and often it's Low Attendance Sunday as well. It really but you almost not have gotten that word. And I thank you for being here. I say that so intentionally. I just thank you personally on behalf of Kenny and the band and Roger as well, because it's an encouragement when we come and gather, which is something that Christians do. It's a part of how we define ourselves as Christians, that on this day we come and gather together, and that you're gathering here on this day with Christians around the world the Sunday after Easter, that's an encouragement to me, and so I thank you for it. We almost always, across Christian traditions, read this scripture on this Sunday, almost always. I think it's because of the reference in the text a week later. How long has it been since we celebrated Easter, Kenny? Brilliant student, brilliant. So this text is a week later. All right, and so that's why it lends itself so much to this Sunday. And 
In so many Christian traditions, they've been celebrating Easter all week long in different ways, and they end that what's called the Easter octave on this Sunday with this story about Thomas. Now, he has popularly, and I think unfortunately, often been known as Doubting Thomas. Where was he that he missed out on that appearance that Easter evening? Where was he? What was he doing? And he wasn't there in the room with all the other disciples. And when they told him that they had seen the Lord, I can only imagine it must have made him feel very left out, the only one not to be there. And so he responds, well, unless I see it myself, I won't believe it. So he separates himself from the others and understandably, I think, demands to see this proof of the risen Christ for himself. We get some insight into Thomas's character by reading earlier in John's gospel about him. Remember when Jesus is in Galilee and makes the decision to go to Jerusalem and he tells the disciples, we're going to go to Jerusalem, although we will suffer there. Thomas says to the others kind of gloomily, well, we might as well go with him and die with him. You know, is that bravery or is that kind of a pessimistic pragmatism there? And later in chapter 14, in the upper room, when Jesus is speaking so beautifully of his going, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself. And where I am going, you know, you know the way. And Thomas kind of impertinently hollers out, Lord, we don't even know where you are going. How can we know the way? Thomas announces he won't believe in the resurrection without the required proof before he sees it with his own eyes and touches Jesus' hands with his own fingers. And too often, I think the larger church across time, including the church in my childhood and adolescence, labeled Thomas kind of a bad guy. We labeled him as either kind of dull or a follower of Christ we don't want to imitate. The moral of the story was clear. Don't be like Thomas. Believe, but don't doubt. But I'm so glad that the scriptures are more faithful than we are. I'm so glad that the Bible doesn't let us do that, that the Bible insists on remembering Thomas's journey and insists on remembering that he also was a part of the first group of those who saw the resurrected Jesus. Philip Yancey, whom, who was for maybe over 30 years a popular Christian writer and very thoughtful, he tells a story once of being asked to come on to a, a fairly evangelical and conservative college faculty. And as a part of it, they wanted him to sign a statement of belief. He said he looked at the statement of belief, and it was basically the essentials of the Apostles' Creed, but it ended with the line, without doubt or equivocation, I believe these things. And he told them, I can't sign this. And they said, don't you believe these things? He said, it's not the things you're listing, it's the without doubt or equivocation. I can't even sign my own name, he says, without doubt or equivocation. <laughs> doubt is a part of what helps faith to stay alive, that we have a place for it. And just as Thomas was welcome in the upper room, even with his doubts, the church also rightfully is a place that welcomes those who come with questions and doubts and ask them to be a part of the community of faith as well. So we should have a big sign out front that says, Pomacea Presbyterian Church, doubters and questioners welcome here. At least following this story from the Gospel of John. In the Orthodox tradition, they don't call this Doubting Thomas Sunday. They call it Thomas Believes Sunday. And they focus on his confession of faith. Do you recall it? A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered, here's his confession of faith, My Lord and my God. It may be the high point of the Gospel of John because he confesses Jesus not only as Lord but also God. I don't think there's another place in John's Gospel where someone says that about Jesus. So the church out of this story rightfully moves openly 
to welcome those who come with doubts or questions. We're glad you're here and I'm here right along with you. And sometimes we all need to see or need to touch or to hear a voice again speaking to each of us. It's clear, now it's clear in the Gospels that believing, not doubting, is a major theme. Uh, doubting is not preferred. I'm not trying to play up the romance of doubt here. Jesus makes it clear, after all, that it's more blessed to believe than to doubt. But this story also helps us to remember and to understand that doubt is a part of the symphony of faith. It plays a supporting melody in our journey and in the larger church's journey. And Thomas's expressed doubts do not make him an outcast from the community. Note that. He stays in the community, in the fellowship, even with his doubts. A week later, he's still with them there. He's still showing up. And that's what I hope all of us will do too, even with our doubts, to stay with them in the fellowship until he comes to the experience that leads him to that great confession, my Lord and my God. Boy, when Thomas gets it, he really gets it here. Thomas held out for an experience of Jesus on his own terms, on the same terms the other disciples had, his own personal experience. And only then does he make his statement of faith. Thomas has to make a personal connection with Jesus himself. Mary, even though she's at the tomb first, cannot experience the resurrection for the other disciples. And the disciples cannot experience Jesus for Thomas. It's faith, not doubt, that holds out for one's own experience of Jesus. But the road to faith is accompanied with many turns, and there's a place for doubt in this journey. Amy Hunter is a kind of a poet that I read, and she told this story about a time when she was very ill, and I share it now in closing. She wrote, 10 years ago, I had emergency surgery. My sister is a professor, and she was about a week away from giving final exams, and the weekend after final exams, she was getting married. Yet she drove from Miami to Tampa in a hurricane to see me in the hospital. No phone call would assure her that I was alive. She had to see me with her own eyes. She had to hold my hand as she visited next to me on the side of the bed. Sometimes the demand to see is not doubt. Sometimes it's an act of love. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you welcome us as we are. Thank you that you invite us to come in this journey of faith until you meet us and raise us also with you in your resurrection. In your holy name we pray, amen.